Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Chad Coolis, Executive Director of the Midway Chamber of Commerce. And I know that many of you were here this morning and got to hear from Carol Burton. And now you'll be here for our keynote presentation with Dr. Paul Priebenau. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is our sixth annual leadership summit. We've always been doing it with Augsburg and you're gonna hear from Alan in a minute. Uh, but first I wanna welcome today's sponsor. We can't do our programming without our supporters. And I'm happy to introduce a longtime chamber member with a, a newer name. Please welcome from American National Bank, Kathy Berkey. Kathy. Hi, thanks, Chad. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, as Chad said, I am with American National Bank, uh, formerly Western Bank, and we are very excited to be sponsoring this event. Um, as you may or may not know, Western Bank was purchased by American National Bank about nine years ago and have been operating under Western Bank ever since. Uh, but in October, the decision was made to change our name to American National Bank. So uh, we're all getting used to it. It's a great name and uh, we're moving forward with it. So, um, you know, we have been a part of the Midway Chamber for many years. I don't even know how many. Uh, we've been in the Midway community for over a hundred years and happy to be here. We're primarily a commercial bank working with uh, small to mid-sized businesses. And we're really excited about some things that uh, have happened recently, uh, including our system upgrade, which is new as of last weekend. So um, as you, anybody who's been through one of those upgrades knows, it's, it's, a, it's an adventure, but it's a good one. And uh, so we're excited to be able to, with this new upgrade, uh, provide even better service to our customers with you know, online access, uh, treasury products like positive pay, ACH filter, accounts payable solutions, purchasing cards, and many more things. So uh, we're happy to be here. We'd love to talk to you about any business needs you might have. So uh, reach out if, if we can help you in any way. But uh, again, we're really happy to be here. Uh, the Midway Chamber is a great part of the community. We're happy to be a part of it. And we thank you for the opportunity to sponsor. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. And, and Kat, like Kathy mentioned, uh, the bank she's at has been a longtime member and Kathy's been involved with the chamber for a long time. I know a lot of you know her. And uh, one way that we want to get back to our normal programming is to do breakouts uh, at our luncheons. And I know that we just did a breakout a little bit ago, but uh, I want to just give everybody an opportunity to do just a little bit of additional networking. So we are gonna just do breakout rooms once again and just take a couple of minutes, introduce yourself and hopefully you'll have a chance to see some old friends and also make some new ones. Hello there, President Primanow. Hi, Chad. I'll stay here. I learned how to not go into breakout rooms. <laughs> so. Okay, good. Well, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. You know, um, we're uh, we're having to make lots of tough decisions in a very short time frame with a lot, not a lot of information. So I I've been saying over the last week or so that uh, you know last summer I thought was tough, but at least we had requirements and oh backup from. Um, from the governor, uh, but now we, of course he's, it's the wild, wild west, you know, <laughs> so every individual institution is having to make those decisions for itself. So, um, so that's where we are, you know, on vaccines and all of that and trying to get ready for the fall and, uh, you know, dealing with a lot of the fear and, you know, exhaustion that people have after a, a year of uh, teaching and learning on Zoom, you know, it takes it out of folks after a while. So I'm gonna try to recover my light here. I lost my ring light off the back of my, but we're not unlike, you know, lots of other institutions, you know, I mean, we're a little different scale and a little different, you know, mission and product or service that we provide, but it still raises a lot of the same kind of questions. So, um, yeah, well, hopefully with, uh, you know, the semester ending soon, it's kind of good timing for all the colleges and universities to have a little bit of a break before you have to figure everything out by the fall semester. Yeah. What's, uh, what will summertime look like on campus? Well, we're doing, um, uh, we are allowing uh, camps to come back for day camps, no, no overnights. Uh, and that seems to be the case across all of our institutions. Um, all of our summer courses are online and most of them have always been online. So it wasn't much of a change. Uh, so we do have some, a few students who live on campus and students who work on campus, but um, you know, the summer 
would normally be a lot busier with overnight camps where we have students, young people here from, you know, toddlers all the way up to, you know, high school students coming, especially for sports camps and debate camps and different things like that. But, uh, but yeah, you know, the interesting news uh, for Augsburg, I mean, we uh, we have a very early end to our semester. So we've been done for two weeks already. Um, so we've had some time here in May to begin to think about, you know, what we're going to be uh, doing uh, to make some decisions for the fall. And, and the problem is that we have to make decisions because part of it is the story you tell to the students who are, you know, either incoming students or to those who are coming back about what it's going to be like. And to get to that point, you've got to then think through the implications of you know, where we're going to be on September 1st when you don't really know where we're going to be on September 1st. So, um, you know, and the issue that's that's really circulating around whether you mandate the vaccine or if you encourage it and, you know, all of that uh, kind of, you know, the opt-in, opt-out, <laughs> and how you capture that information for an institution with 3,500 students and, you know, 600 employees is a, uh, is a kind of a daunting uh, task, but um, we're... <clears throat> We're working on all those fronts. So, um. yeah. Well, uh, it's a it's a big undertaking for sure. But at least you're not alone. Everybody's dealing with it, so you can all you know find out what's working for others and what they're going to do. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to hit close all the rooms, and then that'll give people 60 seconds to get back, and then we'll get going uh, shortly. And then, oh, actually, do you want to just test your uh, share screen? And make sure you can do it. Share the sound, make sure I do that. Here. Okay, you getting the Yep, you're good to go. So okay. um if you want to just take it down for right now, but looks like you're you know what you're doing, so yep. there we go. Perfect. I'm closing the room so they get the, the message now and then they'll come back in. Jameson, you're ready to just kick it off when uh, everybody gets back. I'm ready. All right. We got everybody back. Well, welcome back. I'm Jameson Randall. I'm the current board chair of the Midway Chamber and just great to see everybody here this morning. Um, you know, it's it's really nice to see you in these breakout rooms. I think we're really great. I It was great to meet some new people one-to-one -one on a smaller scale. So. That was a great idea. Thanks for helping set that up. Um, hey, did you guys know that about 20% of the Midway Chambers members are nonprofits? So we're bringing back uh, the Nonprofit of the Month Awards. And this is really exciting. I love this event. Um, I'm pleased to welcome back this Nonprofit of the, of the Month. And to announce this month's, please welcome from Highway Credit Union, we have Mark Podolanik. Hey, Mark, are you here? You can uh, present for us. Yeah, you bet. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Jameson. Uh, this month, we recognize a new chamber member, Flying Pig Thrift. And here's a little about the store and its co-founder. Uh, Melody is the co-founder of Flying Pig Thrift, a nonprofit thrift shop she and her husband started in honor of Melody's sister, Heather. The shop opened in July 2019 at the northeast corner of Snelling and Minnehaha, and it had a strong and it has had strong support from the community from day one. The Flying Pig Thrift is a new member of the Midway Chamber, and they are current members of MAVA, the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, and Hands On Twin Cities. Please welcome Melody Lupke.
Melody, you're on mute. How about this? Thank you, Chad. <laughs> um, I said all my good stuff already, so never mind. No, I'm, I'm Melody Lufin. This is our board chair, Anne. Um, and as you have found out, we started two years ago in July. My sister was a children's librarian and a veteran thrifter, and I lost her to cancer um, two years ago now. So I was stewing and figuring out what to do, you know, to honor her and um, to bring keep her spirit going. And so I thought, well, she loved to thrift. And how about a thrift store? So my husband helped me come up with the name Flying Pig because she gave us a flying pig. And that's just so typical of her whimsical, fun, exciting, can-do spirit. And Carmeet Bullman, at the head of MAVA, she and I talked early on about starting this up and she gave me some good advice, some good consult. And Charlie's been with me from the very beginning. And now they both tell me they didn't think it would happen. So they're like, um, but they never raised any doubt with me at all, which I thought was great because I was focused on the goal and not on the obstacles. So luckily I didn't think twice about how are we gonna get donations and where are we gonna find volunteers, which we need all of, um, two years in July. We've been open two years in July and we're getting better and stronger every, every month, I think. We have a sister wall. If sisters come into the shop and they agree to get their picture taken, we take a picture, put it up on the board on the wall. Um, that's a wonderful thing to keep going and honoring, but it's the thrift store and we're having a good time. So, Anne, do you wanna say a few words? Yes, I'm Ann Tiller and I was retired for 13 years um, due to health concerns and just, I was a quilt, I am a quilter and I started making masks and during the, Mark, from March last year from, for COVID. And COVID actually brought me out of retirement. It's like it made everybody else go home and it made me go back to work in the workforce. And it changed my life. I just love it. I was making masks for the neighborhood next door to, um, to add to the pool of masks for the first responders and house, hospital workers. And Melody saw, saw my name and asked me if I would like to make some masks when they, for when they open the store um, in July. And then I said, and then she asked me if I'd like to volunteer at the store and I started volunteering and pretty soon we couldn't have too much overlap with the owner being the president of the board. So they asked me if I would be chair of the board. And I, it's just been a lifesaver, lifesaver for me and a game changer. And I'm just totally immersed. I never thought I'd love this as much as I do. All aspects of running a store, receiving donations, sorting them, pricing them, putting them on the shelves rotating them for sales that we have and working, training in volunteers and seeing them go, go about as fast as they arrive because we have a lot of students. So we're always looking for more volunteers. Every, you know, we talk to customers all the time and sometimes that really catches on, but COVID has scared a lot of people away from working continually or there's been health concerns. So um, we love what we do and we have the people who, commit with us are happy and those who stay are very happy to be here. So we are really grateful to be a part of this community and helping people find place for their loved treasures that they no longer need to have around. And we also wanna certainly work out um, our connection to a nonprofit. We're a nonprofit because we give our money away. After we meet our expenses, we give our money away to Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America and Mob. Minnesota Association for Volunteer Administration. That's, those are really two important nonprofits to us and we will certainly keep that going. We also, I've noticed two things about COVID, the ups and downs. I mean, the COVID obviously, and COVID obviously hurt and had a negative impact on us. Um, volunteers just stopped coming because of COVID. Um, they didn't wanna expose themselves. They didn't wanna expose their families. So we lost over half of our volunteers when COVID came in to being, and that was really a hard, hard period. We also had to close actually for three months um, during the worst of it. And that was a challenge, challenge financially, but there are silver linings to COVID. Um, of course, globally, the reduction in carbon emissions is huge, but here very locally, we discovered that during COVID, a lot of people turned into closet cleaners. They cleaned out their 
closets and their attics and they brought us their treasures. So that was a real benefit to us. Um, we're glad to re help to reinstate the nonprofit of the month. We're honored and glad to be newbies in the Midway Chamber of Commerce. I look forward to getting involved and thus us being connected for a while to come. I must say uh, our hours, our shop hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 11 to six. And we're at Snelling and Minnehaha this Friday and Saturday, we're having a half off sale. So you might wanna come check us out and look what you can get for a bargain, even more of a bargain. But thanks again to the Midway Chamber of Commerce for hosting us. Thank you, Melody. And, um... And, and Flying Pig Thrift for the work that you're doing. Um, and thank you especially to American National Bank for sponsoring us today. We really appreciate that today. My name is Alan Tuchtenhagen and I'm the director for the Center for Leadership Studies and the Master of Arts degree at Augsburg University. Today, I'm especially, especially proud to welcome our keynote speaker. Paul Pribenow is the 10th president of Augsburg University. Since joining Augsburg in 2006, Prebenau has been enhanced the university's role as an active community partner in its urban setting by identifying and embracing activities that mutually benefit Augsburg and its neighbors. The university has achieved national recognition for its excellence in service learning and experiential education. During his term, Augsburg became the first higher education institution in Minnesota to earn the prestigious presidential award for community service, the highest honor possible for service work. He has led the university through a new strategic planning process focusing on three areas, strengthening Augsburg's three-dimensional education, advancing the public purposes of Augsburg education and growing as a sustainable university. Paul also led the university through a significant name change from Augsburg College into Augsburg University. The change recognizes the expansive academic mission serving more than 3,000 students and undergraduate students and graduate students on campus and locations around the world. In his time as president, Augsburg has become one of the most diverse institutions of higher education in the region and a leader in promoting concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion. President Pribenow is now recognized as one of the country's most engaging commentators and teachers on ethics, philanthropy, and American public life. One of the things I appreciate Paul, uh, with Paul the most is the fact that I have learned so much from him. Paul is a great teacher. He's a great leader. And best of all, Paul leads by example and, and, and has been such a good example to all of us on campus. So please join me in welcoming Augsburg's president, Paul Pribenow. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Alan. Um, thanks to the Midway Chamber, and uh, we're so grateful for this partnership. And uh, I know I've had a chance to be a part of uh, several of these leadership talks. Uh, this is the only one that I think has ever been virtual, but <laughs> it's all about history setting right here. We're all setting history with our new versions of these events. I want to say a special word of thanks to Carol Burton, who uh, one of our proud Augie alums from the Masters of Arts and Leadership program, so proud of all the good work she's doing. So uh, hope you'll take her up on her offer to be of help to you. So, so I am um, finishing my 15th year as Augsburg's president. And that, um, let's just say for university presidents, that beats the odds by a long stretch. <laughs> um, and my joke these days is that I should have retired a year ago because it's been quite a year, um, but I didn't. So I just signed a contract renewal for another six years because I want the fun that's gonna come on the other side of this pandemic. And so that's my, uh, my motto right now. But I was so pleased to get this invitation to be able to come and share just some of the uh, some reflections on what uh, what we've learned uh, from um, our experience as a university over the past uh, 15 or so months uh, and hope that some of what I'm able to lift up for you with examples from Augsburg can be relevant to, to your organizations, whether they're nonprofit or small businesses or banks or whatever you might uh, be working with. So um, I'm going to share my screen here to be able to run through a set of Oops, get this up and running. So, so you might notice a subtle change in the title that I originally publicized uh, because when I actually put together this presentation, I, I made a decision to put a question mark after new protocols um, because I originally assumed that I would be talking about lots of new stuff that we might be doing before. But I, I think it's still an open question whether in fact what we've learned during this uh, pandemic or these pandemics is in fact something um, 
really new or whether it has actually taught us to go back to first principles and find ways to lead, ways to be organizations that in fact uh, uh, perhaps get us more grounded, get back to our missions, to our purposes in the world. So, uh, so with that slight change, I'm gonna share with you some thoughts about life and work together um, post pandemic. So I'm going to start here because this is going to give you a sense. This is um, this, of course, is what we're all about. This is the entering class of 2019, the beginning of Augsburg's 150th anniversary, our sesquicentennial year. This was the largest entering class in Augsburg's history, 636 students. Um, as Alan mentioned, we've become a remarkably diverse institution. This entering class was 65% BIPOC students. Uh, you can see that if you look across. And so we have become uh, one of the most uh, diverse private institutions in the country. Um, so this is powerful. I mean, here they were showing up at the beginning of a big, uh, of a big celebration year. But of course, before that year was over, um, we actually didn't get to even finish that celebration year because on March 15th, we made the decision as did uh, many other organizations to completely uh, pivot out of what we do best to so the day-to-day -day, uh, in community face-to-face -face work. We sent all of our students home, which in retrospect was probably one of the worst decisions that could have been made, but that was what we were thinking back in March uh, 2020. Uh, and we pivoted everything to online with the effort to think about how we were gonna finish that semester as strong as we could. And we did, uh, we finished, this, finished 2020 uh, academic year uh, strong and then pivoted into the summer and thinking about planning for the fall. Um, so the next slide shows you then what happens when you move to a different way of capturing all of your entering class. And the entering class in the fall of 2020 was our second largest class in Augsburg's history. So two straight years of record setting classes in our undergraduate. But of course, this is the way we saw them. We saw them on a Zoom. Um, and that has been the way we primarily uh, inter uh, engaged with them really throughout this past year. We are now uh, finished with our 151st academic year. Uh, we did finish it, uh, I think, uh, successfully, though uh, it was exhausting. Uh, it was full of all kinds of challenges, which I will uh, talk about. But I actually believe that our community uh, rose up um, and actually engaged, leaned into uh, the challenges of this year in a way that showed us some important, important aspects and, and character uh, in our community. So I'd like to start with a poem that, uh, this little brief poem by one of my favorite poets, Wendell Berry, has been very valuable for me throughout this year. Uh, it may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. And, then, and that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. Um, Think about that over this past year. So how many times have you been baffled? <laughs> how many times have you been challenged by a completely changing set of information and landscape and you know, all the ways in which we've uh, been fragmented as a society? And so for me, um, to really accept the fact that uh, I might not have all the answers, uh, that I may need to uh, take a step back and think differently about a situation that we find ourselves to be open to kind of constantly surveying that landscape and trying to understand how we can uh, to do the work that we are called to do as a university has uh, certainly been shaped by this uh, Wendell Berry poem. And I will sh be happy to share these slides so that folks uh, want to access to some of this, uh, they can have that. So as I've been thinking about this, uh, and this is really something that I started to put together last summer, um, but of course, uh, you know, in March, uh, we've started to uh, respond to the public health crisis that was COVID-19. We're still, of course, doing that. Um, in particular for the populations that we serve, our students um, in particular, our neighbors here in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood um, in Minneapolis, uh, uh, the economic disruption and impact was, was great for their families. People were losing jobs. They um, uh, you know, had all kinds of challenges in their life that had that economic impact. And then of course, we are located just a few short uh, blocks away from the site of the murder of George Floyd. Um, and in particular for who we serve and where we're located, these uh, the intersection of these three pandemics has raised, um, I think, the level of uh, urgency around our work even to a new level. And so I, I come back to these. We, you're all aware of these. I mean, this is not no surprise that you would really think about these things, I think. But for our communities, it was, in fact, the ways that these three pandemics were uh, emerging at the same time that put a particular pressure on us. But for Augsburg, um, you know, one of the things that uh, really, I think, gave us uh, hope in the midst of everything that we were responding to was the fact, and I, um, Alan mentioned this earlier, but um, uh, we had just adopted a new strategic plan. Um, and this uh, it became very important to us because many of our sister institutions 
had to tap, cast aside plans that they had in place because they were so dealing with what was happening in their life and they didn't have a framework in which to think about how to respond to it. But this plan adopted uh, after a two year process by our Board of Regents uh, in the October of 2019 actually framed our work. And so, and in particular, this vision statement became very important to us. So as a new kind of urban student-centered university, we're educating our students as stewards of an inclusive democracy, engaged in their communities and uniquely equipped to navigate the complex issues of our time. Think about that. I mean, could we have a more uh, complex set of issues in the world at the moment that we are sending our students out into? And so our mission, our vision to actually be a place that prepares them for that gave us uh, really a, even a deeper sense of purpose, I think, in the midst of the challenges that we're facing. And then, as Alan's mentioned, the, you know, the specific areas of, of focus that we had in our strategies uh, did give us a framework for doing a lot of the work that we did this year that prepares us to come out of this pandemic, I think even more uh, well situated for uh, sustainability and for thriving into the future. So I give thanks for the timing of having uh, done this plan. I give thanks for all the work that went into this plan and with the commitments that are embedded in it because it gave us the framework for our work. So what I wanna do, um, fairly quickly here so that I can leave some time for questions is I'm going to um, offer three leadership lessons and a couple of examples of, of those leadership lessons in our experience this past year. And then I'm going to offer um, three kind of organizational models, if you will, that we think have been valuable. Uh, and again, I hope some of this will be valuable to you personally as leaders in your own organizations, but perhaps also as you think about um, you think about your uh, organizational um, leadership. So a centered life. Um, I believe that one of the greatest myths um, in the American culture, at least, is this notion that we can find balance. Um, and I think this past year has shown us that probably more uh, than anything. How do you find balance in the midst of, again, pandemics where you're, you've got kids studying at home, you're working from a, a remote site, you've, you've got just so many balls in the air and you're having to live and work in new ways. And what the notion of a centered life and centered leadership has taught me is that it's so important to find your center. Um, it's what Bill George also calls kind of North Star of leadership. Find your center and then make that the hub around which the many things that you need to do are in fact organized, um, deployed, if you will. Um, and it seems to me that one of the things that we learned here at Augsburg um, is in fact that what was most important to us, what we needed to learn to pay attention to most was the needs of our students. It's not that we don't think about their needs at other times, but in particular this year, thinking about bringing them back to campus into a different way of living and learning, what could we do to in fact really focus our attention on, on making this experience as meaningful as we could. And so what you see here is just an example of how we did that. So we uh, basically created a whole kind of brand promise, if you will, around this notion of Augsburg Bold. And it, it showed up just like you see here on our quadrangle. It was on tables that are seated out in the middle of our quadrangle. It's on billboards that we have around campus. Augsburg Bold became a brand framework in which we actually organized a whole variety of activities. Um, going back actually to last summer, we froze our tuition rate. So we made a financial decision that was based on this, the needs of our students, Augsburg Bold. We organized a set of activities in the fall. You see up here in the upper right-hand corner, uh, students doing artwork, working with local artists to make artwork um, as to get them out someplace safe where they could actually be together uh, since we couldn't be in classrooms together. Our students, of course, were very active in all of the uh, justice uh, and racial justice uh, efforts and things going on across the city. And so the focus on George Floyd and what that racial reckoning meant. So all of this became, and then um, the other thing was to think about how we invited them back into our community. So you see, that's actually me there um, last uh, July out around the Twin Cities delivering those signs to our incoming students. <clears throat> so they couldn't come to us, but we could go to them and we could actually um, you know, have a yard sign that would, so they would be able to promote in their own neighborhood the fact that they were, so think about that. You take a, a, a brand promise like that and then you think about a whole variety of initiatives within it that in fact, um, focus your attention on what's most important, help to attend to what's most important. And for us, that was the needs of our students. So what is your center? What is your center as a leader? What is in fact your center as an organization that you revolve around? It might be in a mission statement, it might be in a purpose statement, but uh, this pandemic has taught us that uh, even more importantly, how it is to hold on to that center and not get distracted by all the other things that might be pulling us in different directions. So uh, centered life, centered leadership, learning to pay attention. A second idea that became very important to us was this notion of 
practicing abundance. Um, you know, in some ways, we could see this whole last year as a time of loss. Um, we lost the ability to be together, to work the way we uh, you know, had always wanted to work or have learned to work. Um, and I think it was so important in our leadership to think about uh, saying to folks, it's going to be different. We understand it may not be what you expected, but how can we actually still live out our mission, live out our commitments as an institution uh, with our students, even in the midst of this pandemic? And so this became a, a abundance here actually means taking what you have and figuring out how you can make the most of it. Um, it's fighting against the notion of scarcity that I don't have enough, I've lost something. Instead, it's to say, what have I gained here? What have I learned? And what can I do with that? And so this uh, particular example I want to offer you here is, uh, is very, um, perhaps some of you know this, um, uh, for 40 years, Augsburg has hosted something called Advent Vespers. And so it's part of our church tradition. And at Central Lutheran Church in downtown Minneapolis, we will host um, over uh, three days, about 12,000 people who come there to hear our choirs sing and bands play and the like. Well, we couldn't do that. So what are we going to do? Do we just cancel it all? Um, no, what happened was that our folks uh, that organized that got together and said, we can still present something that brings the best of Augsburg to folks in a new format, a new modality. And so what we did is we organized a, a 31 minute um, a video version of Advent Vespers uh, under the theme, Come Now Breath of God. So not simply uh, just a general kind of biblical theme, but in fact, a theme that went directly to the George Floyd situation. Um, and that's our pastor Babette in the middle, um, our university pastor wearing the I Can't Breathe a mask. And just a reminder again, that that pandemic could break us down, but is it is can we learn out of the George Floyd situation something that's important about this community? And so I'm going to just play you about a one minute clip of that came of excerpts from that Advent Vespers to show you, I think, uh, how powerful uh, it really um, was for us. I'm gonna hope that I can make this work. Um, <laughs> And the word was with God. And the word became flesh, breath and bone and blood and lived among us. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful star. sorrow do we have to collectively endure to be competent of the stresses the world endures see we never fully heal see the veil was torn so we'd lean on weeping with those who mourn are we burden bearers or ashes full of urn fill our homes with hope as you search our hearts help us forgive offenses and deepen our faith So we couldn't go to Central Lutheran, uh, but we could bring music to people in these uh, virtual ways. It was a very powerful half an hour. If you care to look at the whole thing, it's on our YouTube channel. But um, so the final uh, theme for me is this idea of stewardship or keeping our promises. And, and though I, the, the screen here shows you um, specifically around our philanthropic efforts, I think this is a broader theme. Um, and that is that you know, one of the things that could happen in a pandemic is that in fact, you do pull back from relationships, you pull back from the real work that you're about. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, you know, in, in the case of nonprofits where we're um, uh, raising money or helping volunteers, I, as the 
Flying Pig thrift shop showed us. They lost some volunteers. And so how do you reach in? And then you find somebody like uh, a board chair who comes in and comes out of retirement to be able. So there's a notion of stewardship about keeping promises. And what we found uh, in our fundraising efforts this past year, specifically as an example of this, was that in fact, uh, people said, no, we're not gonna back away from this. We need to be able to respond to our students' needs, to the institution's needs, to our neighbors' needs, and we need to be asking people to join us in that work. And so um, many of you know the Give to the Max effort that happens every November. Uh, we've uh, long participated in it, but this was a record-setting year for us. We raised more than a half a million dollars on that day for 41 different projects on campus, and not just for our students, but actually also for our neighbors, food and security issues in the neighborhood, um, other challenge, tutoring uh, challenges for students. Um, we also um, uh, developed a whole set of special initiatives that were really in response to our need for students to have emergency funds available to them. Um, just a whole example of how um, we, kept, we came out with a story out of this pandemic that was about the various gifts that people could offer to support this mission-based work. We didn't back away from that. We were uh, proactive, if you will. We, we wanted to lean into that work. And um, I think now coming to the end of this year, um, we've just uh, are very proud of how folks, uh, alums, parents, uh, friends of the university have responded to those requests. So, so another important leadership lesson is need to think about our work as stewardship and keeping the promises that we make to each other. So then let me just uh, pivot to talking about three uh, organizational lessons and again, some quick examples that came out of this. And some of these were already underway, but I think they um, in some ways uh, became even more uh, urgent and more focused uh, in the work that we did during the past 15 months. First is um, this notion that um, many of our organizations, not just universities, many of our organizations are based on an organizational model that we inherited from lots of years of people putting things together. And, you know, it goes all the way back to the late 19th century and the notion of a bureaucracy and the kind of organizational model that comes out of there's hierarchy and all the things that goes with that. And I have long believed, um, Alan didn't mention this, but I'm a social ethicist by academic training. And so I've long believed that in fact, we can't get stuck in a particular organizational model. We've got to be open to different ways of organizing um, ourselves to get the work done. And one of the ways we've done that here at Augsburg is to think about uh, like-minded organizations that um, could join with us formally or informally to do work together that we couldn't do as well on our own. And my favorite example, to be quite honest, uh, over the past several years, uh, something called the Minnesota Urban Debate League. Um, and back uh, 10 years ago, the Minnesota Urban Debate League was a freestanding 501c3 nonprofit organization that provided volunteer coaches to set up debate programs in Twin Cities high schools. Well, about a decade ago, they came to us and said, you know, it's hard for us to, uh, to build the infrastructure to support this work. Would you be interested in partnering with us? And so uh, long story short, ultimately the Minnesota Urban Debate League became a program of Augsburg University. Um, and so all of our infrastructure then became available to them, um, whether it's computers or financial systems or you know, space or whatever they needed, but they continued to do their work in high schools and middle schools, expanded to middle schools, and now are expanding across the state. And they're doing it in ways that are actually uh, through an equity lens. So they are focused specifically um, on time to think about how debate creates a pathway for students through middle school, high school, to higher education, and ultimately into the workforce in some way. And in particular, there's a real interest among the law profession in this. Um, and what's been fun to watch is that it was started, of course, as a, primarily in English. It's now expanded. There are specialized programs in Spanish and Somali. So we're responding directly to the students that are in the schools uh, in our metro area. So think about that. I mean, they could have been out there on their own doing this good work, but they become a partner for us. We share uh, services and the like with them. And ultimately they also represent us then as an institution that cares about um, uh, the equity in the middle schools and high schools and the broader community. So uh, just a simple example of a variety of ways that I think we all could learn to think about how we can partner with each other. It doesn't have to be informal kind of mergers, but in fact, partner with each other to get more done as a result um, of uh, you know, understanding that that's a better use of resources. A second idea that I think is, uh, as I've just recently come upon this notion that I think actually we've been living it out uh, for several years, and that is the notion of being what they, uh, the authors of this particular article call an elastic hybrid organization. And I love that notion uh, because we do have a center, we have a mission as an institution, 
Uh, but the truth is, um, we also have people who come to us uh, with different life experiences that challenge even for the ways, in fact, we live out that mission. And probably the best example of that for Augsburg is our work in interfaith. And I would just say to all the folks on this call, you are working in businesses and uh, corporations and, and uh, nonprofits, uh, interfaith skills may be the next set of skill workforce skills that we need to be providing because you are working in settings where people of different faith traditions are working alongside each other. And for them to understand those different faith traditions, understand the implications of it for how somebody works, for their life experience, we believe is in fact uh, going to be one of the most important um, kind of uh, next steps, if you will, in building workforce skills. But for Augsburg, what it's meant is that as our student population has become more diverse, we've actually got almost a classroom for this work right here on campus because we have students from a variety of traditions but we were founded by Lutherans and we're still associated with the Lutheran church. So we have a deep commitment to our Lutheran Christian faith that is our grounding. It's, it's in our governance documents. It's, uh, it's part of our overall mission, but we are also a place that welcomes in and, and supports students and others, faculty and staff from different faith traditions and non-faith traditions. And so we, we really have found this to be a very valuable and how you think about your organization being open to that. How do you think about, um, about how you will be grounded in a particular perspective, but then also think about uh, how you're flexible, if you will, elastic, if you will, to think about this work. And I would urge you, if you're interested, this um, uh, we are also home to something called the Forum on Workplace Inclusion, and they just did this wonderful um, uh, webinar just a couple weeks ago. You see it there, um, uh, which talked about religion in the workplace and about this kind of whole challenge to think about how we build interfaith skills. Um, and it's very practical. I mean, we're not talking about just theoretical stuff. We're talking about practical day-to-day practices that are linked to what it means to be somebody who's living uh, in an interfaith setting. Um, so the final um, one may, may sound a little bit uh, uh, religious or theological, but of course this concept of the beloved community uh, comes from Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and I just want to, this is a picture of um, our faculty, staff, students, mostly students, gathering for a vigil on the evening of the day that the uh, Chauvin trial verdict was announced. Um, and I stood here with them and listened to their both lifting up justice done in that moment, perhaps, um, uh, in the verdict, but then this deep longing that our students have for the fact that we don't lose sight of how much work there is yet to be done. And for me, that um, is an illustration of how this work um, has to belong to a community. It has to be, we have to think no matter where, in what kind of setting we're in, um, we have to think about how we do this work in common and how we come together to have each other's back and how we build a community that in fact uh, really does understand that, um, that the skills of community building may be uh, some of the most important skills that we are teaching each other because we live in a world where it's a lot of time about me and about I and about mine uh, as opposed to the fact that in fact it belongs to uh, all of us in some fashion and we need to understand how to form those communities. Uh, Alan mentioned that we uh, offer our students a, a three-dimensional education. And the way we talk about that is we teach our students to make a living, uh, to make a life, but also to build community. That's the third piece. Um, and so very practically, we are actually educating our students, training them, if you will, with the skills of democratic engagement. Um, they get it as they arrive on campus as first year students. And so when they have those skills and they gain them here, they then take them into the workplace or into nonprofit organizations for the sake of thinking about how they can build community there to get the work done, to advance a mission. So uh, that was a particularly poignant moment of our community coming together, but, but a, a very, I think, significant model for, for organizations that are, that's really worth uh, you know, trying to understand and think about. So there's my um, three leadership lessons, three kind of organizational models. Let me just talk quickly before I open it up about two different case studies where I think a lot of these things come together. So Augsburg, because of our student population, the diversity of our student population, our commitments to equity and inclusion, which we've been at work uh, on for the past uh, 10 or 12 years. Um, uh, in some ways, the urgency after the George Floyd situation brought us to bring a lot of that work even uh, to a higher level of urgency and focus. And so um, we celebrated uh, in the spring of 2020, just before the pandemic, um, something as part of our sesquicentennial year, we celebrated something called One Day in May. So back in 1968, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, the president then, Oscar Anderson of Augsburg, um, organized a day, no classes. They brought in many speakers to kind of challenge Augsburg to think about what it meant to live uh, as a place committed to anti-racism. Um, and so 
um, we tracked then the history of that work over some period of time, over decades, 50 dec uh, 10 dec uh, five decades, sorry, um, to 2020 and took stock then of how we were doing. So we were actually prepared as the pandemic hit and the George Floyd uh, murder happened in our neighborhood to think about what are we gonna do now to even lift this work up higher? So that has led us to a mandated uh, anti-racism training for all of our faculty and staff. It has led us to um, a certificate, a very robust certificate program that some of you may know about. I don't know if Joanne has actually talked to this group before. Joanne Reek, our Vice President for Equity and Inclusion. Uh, it's led us to a variety of philanthropic efforts, um, but it's also led us to the creation of a new um, academic program called the Critical Race and Ethnic Studies Program, which will be launched next fall on campus with three brand new faculty members recruited specifically to help our students who come to us with a lived experience as Latinx, as uh, Pan-African, as uh, Asian, uh, Pan-Asian um, or native indigenous students for them to be able to have a place where they can study their own life experience like our white students can do in other places here. So for us to be able to respond specifically to who our students are. Um, uh, this uh, Bill Green, many of you know Bill Green, he uh, is a member of our faculty, uh, was also the, served as the superintendent of the Minneapolis schools for several years, but Bill has just been named the inaugural professor of critical race and ethnic studies. So we are that leadership from within the institution. And then to think about um, uh, fellowship programs for students that is just starting the Sankofa Circle and, and the leadership of that across our staff is a very important uh, kind of, again, key aspect of what we're trying to do to build uh, an institution that is uh, truly trying to live into a kind of anti-racist aspiration. And that takes hard work. I think as Carol mentioned, we talked about that. This is incredibly hard work, um, especially for an institution that's been shaped by traditions that are primarily dominated by white people. Um, and we know that. And so uh, the humility that it takes to, uh, as a 64 year old white guy who has the privilege of leading this institution at this moment, you know, it takes a deep sense of humility, of willingness to listen, of being an ally, of being willing to make mistakes and, uh, and know that uh, that forgiveness may be the most important skill we learn. Um, all of that fits into this work, which I think has again come to have even more meaning for us as we come out of this pandemic. And then the final thing that I would mention as a case study is the work we do off off campus. So we have for uh, 13 years been part of a national movement called the Anchor Institution of Movement. And what that is, is it's a, it's a recognition by urban based, uh, primarily healthcare and education, higher education institutions, that they play a very important role in their neighborhoods and in their communities. But they're often perceived as trying to impose solutions on their neighborhoods, as opposed to learning how to be neighbor with those other organizations and other folks that live in the neighborhood. And so we formed something called the Cedar Riverside Partnership uh, 13 years ago. And then about seven or eight years ago, we formed the Central Corridor Anchor Partnership. And through both of those organizations and the members that serve with us, um, we are bringing a model that says we come to the table and we state our self-interest. Uh, we, we have, I mean, I want a safe neighborhood for my students. I, you know, I want a neighborhood that has good placemaking in place so that our people are attracted, want to come here, and it's not you know, a place that people are afraid of coming to. But when I enter into conversation with other neighbors, they state their self-interest. And what we find actually in the conversation is we find shared value. So for example, uh, this past year, one of the biggest challenges in our immediate neighborhood has been the whole issue of food insecurity. Um, and so we have banded together with our friends from M Health Fairview, with the Lake, Lake of, a local business association, with Pillsbury United Communities, the place all folks who have a stake in this neighborhood. And we have figured out how to work together with our neighbors to both bring food to folks, uh, but also to respond to the underlying kind of challenges that lead to food insecurity. Um, and so things like the Soup for You Cafe, which is something that uh, happens in a building that we happen to own across the freeway from Augsburg on Franklin Avenue, um, offers free meals every day uh, at lunch. Um, and even in the pandemic, though they couldn't invite people into the church to get those meals, they were delivering the meals out the door to folks. Anybody who showed up got a free meal. Um, and so just an example of a, of a program that in fact lives out this anchor institution commitment to be a neighbor uh, and to think about that the well-being of this neighborhood is important to all of us and, and the work we can do together to share resources and to share our kind of aspirations for for justice and wellness and compassion uh, it really has shaped that work in lots of important ways. So I am uh, at the end of my formal slides and I'm going to stop sharing so I can see your faces um, and uh, would welcome. I've got a few minutes to chat. I think if folks had questions or comments that they wanted to um, 
ask, I'd be happy to try to respond. Yeah, Paul, we've got a couple of questions um, here. One is from Dennis Wolf, and he asks, what will life at Augsburg look like come this fall? And do you see some benefits coming about, ironically or otherwise, following the pandemic, um, following the pandemics and, and what's happened? Yeah. Yeah, so Chad, Chad and I had this uh, conversation uh, while we were, we were in breakout rooms. Uh, you know, it's sort of the wild, wild west right now because of with the governor's decision and uh, CDC uh, recommendations, basically they've just said back to institutions, you decide now how you're going to keep each other safe. And so issues of vaccines and, and mitigation strategies and all those kinds of things are something that very much on our mind. We are um, right now focused on uh, trying to encourage a very high level of vaccination for our faculty, staff, and students. And we're going to do that. Uh, we're not going to mandate. I think I can say that pretty definitively. But we are going to strongly encourage and then make as many folks uh, have the access to the vaccines that we can. We have a very good relationship across the street with the People Center. We do clinics with them. Um, so our hope is that, that life can look much closer to normal um, when come the fall, when we bring students back in. Right now, our enrollment numbers for this coming fall actually would surpass last year. So they it would become the second largest class in our history. So, so it's important for us to be able to offer them what Augsburg does best. Um, so that's that's our hope. I, I would say that um, you know, some of the lessons we learned have actually been through things like Zoom. I mean, um, we run very efficient meetings now on Zoom. And though it tires you out after a while, if you have to spend a whole day on it, I mean, there are lots of things that we can do on Zoom that are much more efficient. Um, uh, can bring people in from a much wider, so for example, with our board meetings, we have people around the country and we can do committee meetings with them on Zoom, of course, and they don't have to travel to, um, we have found that conference attending um, for universities, uh, the kind of higher education conferences and things that we would normally, they actually have higher participation rates because people can do them um, uh, virtually. So I, that's one place. Our faculty would tell you that um, they have learned lots of skills about using technology to teach that they will now make a part of it. They'll still do the face-to-face -face as they can, but they will also use the tools that technology provides to actually enhance that education, to take away from the classroom, perhaps the, fact, the need to do a lecture, when in fact you could tape that lecture, let students listen to it ahead of time, and then come in ready to talk, uh, which would be actually where the learning happens. Um, and then I think also um, we have uh, certainly seen that for our faculty, especially given our students, um, we don't have all of our students living on campus. So um, in fact, only about half of them do. So our faculty using Zoom for office hours. You all remember, if you were in college, you remember you know, the hour that was available once a week <laughs> to visit Professor so-and-so, and you hoped he or she were there when you got there. Um, well, our faculty have actually used Zoom very effectively to uh, be much more flexible. And so our students have actually been able, if they've uh, pursued it, to have even better engagement with their faculty, which we know is an important part of what we do, so. Um, okay. Thank you. Another question, actually Chad's asking this question, a class of that is 65% diverse, it's very impressive. Many organizations struggle to become more diverse. How did Augsburg emerge as a leader in this category? Yeah, that's a great story. Um, it's a great question and a great story. Um, it uh, started about uh, 17 years ago. Um, I mean, Augsburg's always been a bit more diverse than other private institutions because of where we're located. And um, But what happened was that about 17, 18 years ago, just before I arrived, um, our admissions office here started to uh, really connect very uh, strongly with the um, college readiness programs. So Page, Wallen, College Possible, you may know some of these uh, names. These are programs that reach back into high schools to help create pathways, especially for student, first generation students of color. And what came as a result of that was we started to build trustworthy relationships with communities of color uh, in high schools, uh, in different neighborhoods. And ultimately that led pretty quickly after I arrived. So just to give you a, a quick example, the entering class my first year, 2006, was 18% students of color. Um, and as I said, the last three years, it's been 65%. Um, so what that shows you is 15 years of work of expanding uh, the circle of those trustworthy relationships, um, uh, creating programs that create pipelines of students that come to us, or partnerships with other organizations that actually create a pipeline of students that come. Um, and then it's, to be quite honest, it, at some point it's reputational. Um, so once we are known for being a place that cares deeply about, uh, again, it's not diversity we care about, it's equity we care about and, uh, and inclusion that we care about. And so diver diversity is a fact. Um, and that has become a part of our our real message to folks and 
you know, my argument, and again, for this audience, I would say this, I, you know, I see Kate is on here from our Strauman Center for Meaningful Work, which is our career center. Uh, I mean, I'm very popular with the HR offices now at local companies because I've got a population of students who are the future leaders. Um, they fit the demographic of future leadership for our, these organizations. And I'll tell you the question I ask them when we sit in their office and when we're able and talk about this is that, are you ready? Are you ready for our students? And I think that's why Carol's work is so, is so important because many of them will admit that they are not. Um, they have not done this work in the kind of deep way that uh, needs to be done in order to be a place that both creates access, but then creates success. And that for me is, um, you know, it's to and through, that's the language we use. Hospitality is not enough. Um, access is not enough. It's gotta be about success. And that's about how you put in place all the resources that are necessary for someone to uh, persist, to be supported and to ultimately be successful in whatever way you, you uh, judge that. So, um, so I often hear from my fellow presidents, oh, we'd love to be as diverse as Augsburg. And I said, are you willing to do the work? That's really the question. As an organization, are you willing to do the work? And um, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see. I hope so. It, um, it looks like we're out of questions. I, I, I wanna thank you, President Pribinow for doing this. And just to circle this back, just taking off on your last comment here, one of the things that the rest of you probably don't know is typically when President Pribinow opens up the academic year and talks to all of our, our students, he gives a very good talk. I've heard it give it several times about what is it that's expected of you? And you show up, pay attention, do the work. And it's such a message for life that Paul delivers. I wanna give him credit that a good share of his leading by example and the message he typically shares is one of the ways that an organization can move through this and institutional leadership is so critical. And what does it take? You show up, you pay attention and you do the work and all the things about that. So anyway, thank you, Paul. Thank you to all of you who are here today. Um, Chad, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thanks, Alan. And, and uh, thank you, President Primanow again. Um, you know, that question that I asked you and you're saying it started off, you know, 18% and now you're at 65% is also just a reminder to everybody that it's a commitment and it's, it's not going to be something that you just magically get to overcome overnight that it's, it takes a long time. Um, and this recording and, and same thing with Carol's earlier today will be available to everybody. We'll email that out to everyone who uh, had signed up today. And I just want to remind everybody about our next event we have, which is hearing from the Ramsey County tax assessor. So you can learn a little bit more about how properties get assessed. That's next Tuesday over the lunch hour. And then Thursday, we're excited that we are doing a ribbon cutting for Bole Ethiopian Cuisine, which reopened in a new space. And we're having this event, uh, it's just coincidentally, but basically one year exactly after uh, his building had burned down. We'll be joined by Mayor Carter. Uh, the event starts at four o'clock, but the program will begin at 4.30. So hope to see you at our events next week. And again, the recording will be available later. Thank you, everybody.